P3P. It continues on our pathway broken down for energy, but the second one in enzyme will immediately convert into a second G3P glycolysis. Come on, sugar, come on, sugar, for the breakdown. For the breakdown. Phase 3, G3P gets rearranged and oxidized by an enzymatic assembly line that harvests energy from each G3P. One NADH and two ATPs. Double this yield for G3P to two NADH and four ATPs. That's the gross yield for every glucose in. A generous accounting of glycolysis is win, but two ATPs were invested in phase one, so you net just two. You can use to jump a run, but two in, get four out, your net gain is two. Two ATPs that you can use. If that doesn't seem like very much, it's cause it ain't. There's tons of energy left in pyruvate. The two, three carbon molecules were left with at the end, and what happens to pyruvate is going to depend on the metabolic pathway where pyruvate gets sent. If it's anaerobic, it'll be fermented, but in aerobic cells, pyruvate's termination will be the Krebs cycle and total oxidation. Glycolysis, come on sugar, come on sugar for the breakdown, for the breakdown. Glycolysis starts with investment of two ATPs to the glucose that we started with. The product is cleaved into two G3Ps from which the cell harvests NADH and ATPs. This anaerobic pathway is respiration's first phase, billions of years old, evolved in ancient days before O2 accumulated in the seas. Before eukaryotic cells arrived on the scene, it's everywhere, ubiquitous in every organism. Bacteria, sequoia tree, no matter your metabolism, happens in the cytoplasm, doesn't need no organisms. You want to find glycolysis? Look in any cell. Glycolysis, come on sugar, come on sugar for the breakdown, for the breakdown. Glycolysis, come on sugar, come on sugar for the breakdown. I've come to talk with you again Hello darkness my old friend I've come to talk with you again Because a vision softly creeping Left its seeds while I was sleeping And the vision that was planted in my brain Still remains within the sound of silence In restless dreams I walked alone Narrow streets of cobblestone the halo of a street lamp I turn my collar to the cold and damp When my eyes were stared By the flash of a neon light It split the night And touched the sound of silence And in the naked light I saw Ten thousand people, maybe more People talking without speaking People hearing without listening People writing songs That voices never share No one dare Disturb the sound of silence 
dulce I do not know Silence like a cancer grows Hear my words that I might teach you Take my arms that I might reach you But my words like silence Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Kirsten Mönch. I'm the head of External Communications and Relations, and I welcome you to the auditorium. Um, today, I'd like to introduce Professor Dr. Gruber from the um, Nanyang Technological University, um, the School of Science. And he will share some insights about um, the tuberculosis research with you. So please welcome, give Mr. Gruber a warm welcome, please. I still can say good morning. And um, first of all, thank you very much, Ms. Munch, for the invitation to give this talk here today and for all the efforts of uh, the people who have made it possible, also from the technical perspective. I was very happy when Ms. Munch, a long time back, contacted me and was asking whether we can somehow make connections, make a network between universities in Singapore and your school. And this was a fantastic idea. And uh, as your director just a few minutes before said, yes, we will move on with this idea because the next step after your either Abitur or the IB may or may not be a way to go to university. And this can be in Europe, this can be in Southeast Asia, it can be even here in Singapore. I said, let's go on tour, and I would really like to go with you on tour. And if you would like to go on tour, you have to know a pathway, a way you like to walk to. And before we do that, I would like to underline that when I got this invitation, I was quite proud and very honored because to give a lecture at a school of excellence is really fantastic. And that means you are at a school of excellence. And this is very much underlined even by the signature of the president, the former president of the Republic of Germany, Mr. Gauck. And you have the freedom to grow like this wonderful travel palm, which is the symbol of your school. A travel palm which has its origin actually in Madagascar and came about 100 years ago to Singapore. It has learned to adapt, like you and your families have learned to adapt to Singapore and its environment. Everything in this plant started with a seed. It was simply in the darkness, as we have heard just in the song before, of silence. And growing up to this wonderful green palm is a wonderful phenomenon, because what it tells is that this palm is able to translate energy of light, namely the sunlight, 
into something which we call carbohydrates. And this allows this wonderful palm to grow. And when we compare this a little bit with other organisms, like when you may go to Australia and see this wonderful pink lake, or when you go to San Francisco and fly into San Francisco and see this wonderful beach, which has a similar pinkish color, surrounded by all the white salt of it. So this here is not working. Okay, then I take my mouse. So this is the salt, and this here is not occupied by leaves or plants, but by this bacteria. And this bacteria are called halobacteria. So that means they love salt. And they are purple because they have a protein, which is called bacteriotopsin, which makes them so nicely purple in the membrane. And I thought I should bring this purple bacteria with me to you. Because it allows us to learn to see, or as I said in the plant, to learn to translate light into another form of energy. You can see me, I can see you, because in our eyes we do have a molecule like retinal, the rhodopsin. And they have in their membranes what is called the bacteriodopsin. It has the same kind of molecule which is able to absorb light. Well, bloody hell, we cannot see this mechanism of how it does really see. And we always say seeing is believing. And therefore, I thought, OK, how can I convince you that they can really see light? Well, they are able to do and to absorb the light, as we do, in a very, very fast time. We we'll mean we talk about pico milliseconds. And what they do is they undergo this wonderful, whoops, they undergo this wonderful circle, being purple, then absorbing light, becoming yellowish, and then regenerate to take the next photon of light. And by doing so, to pump then protons. That's something we come to it in a second. So this is this halobacterium. And you see, it's nicely purple. So what we did, we made a nice mutation in this protein. And when we expose this to light, then we can nicely see that it becomes yellowish, as we see on this cartoon. And now it is regenerating, becoming purple. So now the bacterium sees photons. It becomes yellowish. And what it does, it is absorbing the light, this retinal, and makes the switch. And this is nothing else, as you know from when you go home, you turn on light with your switch, on, off, on, off. And that is happening in your eyes, retinal. It gets light, and it switches on, off, on, off. And now, since we have to be able to see again, you have to regenerate even in your eyes. And that's exactly the point. You know, when you have an intensive light flash, you can't see for a minute or a few seconds. So your retina has to regenerate. So what it tells you is we have forms of movements which allow us to take energy and to translate energy. And energy is simply needed for everything we do in our life, and in particular for a biological cell. Because think about what is happening in a nucleus where we have to replicate DNA, when we have to contract our muscles with the myosin so that the myosin can move along actin. Or we have to transport certain things, like we transport stuff over the PIE or BKE. And we have also to generate then this energy in the factory of life, in the mitochondria. So some of them, they can either rotate, or like the helicases you have learned, they can move along the road DNA. Or when you think about the kinesin, 
This can move along the tubules and can then transport vesicles. Or myosin can move along the actin and allows us to contract our muscles. So how do all of these wonderful tiny motors get the right direction? This is something we will look into during this talk. The other point is they all need energy. And we know the main energy of life is adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And when we look into bacteria, then we know they have to survive. And they undergo similar processes of DNA replication. Transport has to occur inside, outside. And as you see here, from this wonderful pathogen, mycobacteria tuberculosis, and as the name is indicating, causing tuberculosis, these pathogens have even a more stressful life because they have also to live under non-oxygen conditions, which is also called hypoxia conditions. So they have to survive under normal oxygen-rich as well as oxygen-poor conditions. And that is, can be quite stressful. But they can do. And the consequence of this for us as researchers who like to discover drugs is we have not only to prevent their growing when oxygen is there, we have also to prevent their growing when no oxygen is there, which happens in our lungs where we have certain situations where these pathogens are encapsulated. And this is what we call latent tuberculosis. I will come to this in a second. Robert Koch, who in around 8080, with his really fantastic team, one has to say, uh, everybody in the team was a really fantastic scientist. And that made it actually able not only to discover that mycobacterial tuberculosis is causing these diseases. No, at this point of time, the people didn't even know how to visualize this bacteria. They didn't come up with this beautiful gallery because they didn't have the microscopes at this point of time. I didn't even know how to, to, to stain this accordingly. So the other point was you have also to cultivate in order to investigate such kind of bacteria. And all of these things, they established. And people in our days sometimes say, OK, this was good. But at the end of the day, he brought up only tubercoline, which is not really a drug. It is something you can use as a screen. This is a bit too weak. We have always to see the whole package of what he and his team has achieved. So mycobacterium tuberculosis and the di discovery of vaccines, as well as also of drugs, is a quite long one. And it may, in particular, your generation irritate you, because we are now in a time of COVID where we are very lucky that even after one and a half years, we got a catalog of antibodies, where we got a catalog of vaccines. And when you think about that in around 1880, 1880, it was known that mycobacteria is causing this disease. Only about 28 years later, one could find a way to diagnose it. Or even 40 years later, the first vaccine came up. And we have to be honest, even in 2022, we don't have a real vaccine against tuberculosis. And then what happened, only in 1943, the first drug came up. This had very much to do with the two world wars, because the number of TB cases was rising significant. And luckily, as you can see here, Drugs came up, in particular also with uh, streptomycin, isoniazide, p a in short, and also ethambutol. This happened all in between 1940s, 1960s. And the bloody thing which happened was resistance immediately occurred. Even rifabutin, it was just on the market. The first two resistant cases came already up. And there was no success until 2012, so just 10 years ago, that a first drug which is useful for or to fight against multi-drug resistance came up, which is called beta-quiline, or in short, 
BDQ. And this is a track which we will discuss a bit more in depth. So it gives you a feeling you now how difficult it actually is when we talk about fighting against mycobacterial pathogens. And now, in 2021, 2022, we have a certain pipeline of drugs uh, which is uh, now on the market and will be further tested. And uh, here you have also with the FATP synthesis, our ones, which, we, uh, or which I will then present to you in a few minutes. So when people ask you in our days, and you may or may not have uh, seen or uh, read the interview I gave recently uh, to the German Tagesschau when the journalist was very surprised to talk with me in 2022 about tuberculosis because she, and same like me, was simply thinking, hey, this is something which happened in the 1970s, 1980s, right? That should be over. No. The point is that about 25% of the world population is infected. And then you would say, okay, they are infected, but are they all sick? No. The point is the majority of them have latent TB. And it may be that even you are already infected, but the bacterium is silent inside of you. And why is this very important for us here, also in Singapore and in the Southeast Asian area? It is because when we consider that the Southeast Asian area makes about 26% of the world population, we have more than 40% of the TB cases here in our area in the majority of India. But we have also cases in Singapore with about 2,000. And the number of latent TB is even higher. Why is it attractive for you to know about it? That is clearly demonstrated in the bar diagram in the middle for, of the WHO, because it makes clear the most common causes of death in your age is tuberculosis. You may be surprised, but this is the case. It's not COVID, it's tuberculosis. So therefore, yes, it should be of your interest to know more about it, to learn more about it. And the next question is, you would say, okay, is there no drug at all? Yes, there's even a regimen of drugs. And you take about four drugs in the first round about several months and then you have to continue uh, with two more trucks over several months and this is a very long time and you in particular have to think about that this tb is very often also happening in non-developed countries so you have not always access to pharma and the major problem is which is coming up is multi-drug and extensively drug resistance. That means they are not only resistant against one of the drug, but even two or extensively more than two drugs. So what the bacterium, mycobacteria needs to survive is of course energy. And like we do, you know, we, we use amino acids, we use fatty acids, we use carbohydrates. And the metabolism of carbohydrates is the most popular one. In particular, when we take this wonderful white gold sugar. So this sugar, and mostly we take glucose as an example, is actually from a chemical pers perspective a quite simple one. Right? We have, as we see, the carbon, we have the oxygen, we have the hydrogen. And this short molecule is claimed by this scientists to provide energy. Is this true? Look, we have here sugar, and I could keep this sugar a whole year at the same place. Nothing would happen. So is that total nonsense that when you have glucose that you're getting energy out? So what it tells us, we need certain enzymes, catalysts, to make use out of this glucose and to cleave this molecule. And the simple equation you are very familiar with of glucose plus oxygen gives water, 
and gives carbon dioxide, which we are breathing out, and energy. So that means this C6 molecule that has to become cleaved into a one single carbon molecule, right? And we have to see that water is generated, which is fine, and of course energy. And this all means, from a chemical perspective, when we say, oh, I'm burning down glucose, in particular two, years, two weeks ago when you had your exams yeah, in, in, in biology, yeah, and maybe one, a few of you uh, took then dextro energy notes forever in the early morning, right? So, and to say, okay, I need energy in particular between 10 and 12 o'clock uh, or uh, 10 to 2 p.m., depending on how long your exam has been. Right? So to provide immediate energy. And when you look to this equation, you see when we cleave it, we at the same time do also a process of, of oxidation. And oxidation goes never alone with reduction. That is why you talk about redox processes. Right? So somebody gives electrons and somebody takes electrons. Means you need a lover of electrons. And the big lover in biology of electrons is oxygen. So we have already a quite cool idea. And when we have seen this rap music before, a process which helps tremendously and enzymes which are helping tremendously are in the, one of the oldest pathway we have on Earth, namely glycolysis. And now I invite you to go with me on tour, namely the pathway of glucose degradation. And you don't have to remember any name. No, we cleave glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. A C6 becomes two molecules of C3. And what we continue to do then is to cleave this C3 molecule into a molecule of C2, which is at the 2QA. And what we cleave also at the same time is carbon dioxide. Hey, for the first time we see that the right equation is fulfilled. Besides the fact we have only one carbon dioxide, and here the equation says six. But since we have a C6, we divide it by two times, we get two times of carbon dioxide. And when we continue then in the next pathway we are walking through, which is called the TCA cycle, which you know better under the Krebs cycle, then we see that our C2 molecule becomes further cleaved and oxidized to two more molecules of carbon dioxide. And since that is happening two times, we have now exactly the six molecules of carbon dioxide. Okay, easy. We didn't have to learn any name. So now what remains for us is what happens then with the hydrogen and what is with that lover of electron, oxygen. And what is actually happening with these electrons I'm always talking about. Because electrons, that means that is energy. As we have seen, with the photons of light. Photons give energy. Electrons give energy, but they cannot survive in the cell without having a backpacker. And what the cell is providing is a nice carrier of electrons, which you call NAD. And when it becomes reduced, it becomes an NADH. It takes the electron and it takes also a proton. Okay. So we have here somebody who takes the electrons and the protons. And we have, have actually a number of these uh, molecules, including also another carrier of electrons, FID. And so therefore, we have fulfilled already quite a lot of our starting equation, namely CO2 is formed. We do see that electrons are moving and being cared by NADH or FIDH. And we do also see what is happening with our protons. Okay, that's fine. But still, we have not seen that water is formed. And we still have not seen that energy is formed. So what happens now? There's this next step also in my microbacteria, as it is in our powerhouse mitochondria, namely the respiratory chain. And the respiratory chain is called respiratory because it is 
using oxygen. It is using oxygen to form water. And all of our carriers of electrons and protons are now entering into this electron transport chain. And what it simply is, as I said in the beginning, this sugar will always be here if we have no catalysts, if we have no enzymes. And our catalysts are in the respiratory chain, which is here called simply NDH, SDH, or you call it also complex one, complex two. And what they do is they oxidize the NADH to NAD. And this NAD can then go back to all the other pathways because it is regenerated. And it moves further these electrons. So, okay, let us keep with this for a while. When I say that oxygen is a lover of electrons, and we still do not know what is happening then with these protons, then we have to say, okay, if we form then water, that would actually mean hydrogen and oxygen are coming together, right? But what happens actually when hydrogen and oxygen do meet? Any idea? Loud. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I know that all of you know it. I'm absolutely sure. Because all guest students know that. This was something, an event, and here you see the connectivity between NTU and your institution. You came to NTU, yeah? And the, the ones who have stayed here already before, and they knew what is happening. And a number of them moved from an excellent guess school to an excellent university in Germany. Somebody I do see here went to a fantastic excellent university you know very well in Darmstadt. People went to Göttingen, people went to Aachen, an excellent university. So that means, yes, there's explosion. And therefore, we have to prevent that an explosion is occurring. And that happens nicely because we have an orchestra of enzymes which slowly puts up the energy, step by step by step by step, so that the electron comes smoothly together with the proton and the oxygen, and this oxygen lover takes the electron, and then water is formed. So it needs all these catalysts to slowly oxidize and to bring the electrons forward to the enzymes we are calling oxidases, right? So they oxidize now, and water is formed. So that's fine. We have a good idea what happens with the electrons. And we have a certain idea what is happening with the protons because water is formed. But still, we have more protons, namely 12, than we have in the water. And that means something has to happen. And we know that a certain gradient is formed, which is causing the membrane potential. What does that mean? So what is the concept of the protons? It is the concept of a gradient. And we know this from this waterfall. This waterfall here is beautiful, but very dangerous. So what we have to prevent is that something dangerous is occurring in the respiratory chain. Therefore, we need small gradients, small waterfalls, which are more refreshing, which are giving energy. And that is actually happening by having several of these pumps which can pump protons coming from the NADH from one side to the other. And when you pump from one side to the other, you generate a gradient and more protons will be then here accumulated and that means you have a change of pH. And that drives then this motor, F-ATP synthesis, which is generating the energy of life, ATP. So here we have this wonderful energy producer, the F-type ATP synthase. And this is made up of a nice ring. And what it does is it pumps protons in between this nice ring and that green structure. We don't need the name of that. And what it does do then is to give, by doing the rotation, the information all the way up 
to what is called the catalytic part here in red and in yellow. So we do see here this nice ring, which people do call a C ring. And depending on which organism we are looking to, either the mitochondrial one in our human mitochondria or the one of mycobacteria or even in certain plants, they all have this ring structure, but they have a different number of the subunits inside. It's quite interesting and this nicely driving evolution. And it tells us how many protons it really needs to form ATP. So can we say that the C-ring is a lot of the ring? What is interesting is that we see quite often in nature that this beautiful symmetry can be of advantage. And we see this even in developmental biology. So we at the beginning have a cell, it's dividing in a symmetrical way, and later on it has to decide where we have the polarity, and then we are not continuing as a symmetric part, although certain things are symmetric in us, but we have a symmetry from the top to the bottom. So it seems that symmetry has a certain advantage, but if you introduce a, a symmetry, even in business and in the bank sector, it can have an advantage. Why? Let us look again. We have here symmetry in the ring, and we have here symmetry of six subunits which are forming an hexamere. And when we look a little bit into this catalytic center where the synthesis is occurring, then we can nicely compare this with a kind of orange. Let us look. Red here is the alpha. Yellow is the beta. So and the shape is quite comparable to a segment of a mandarin. And I have removed here the white piece which you always like to remove before we eat the mandarin. And that is nicely the piece which we call the gamma, which is penetrating into this hexamere, as we can see. So why is it important to have symmetry here and symmetry here, but interrupted by asymmetry? If you have two symmetrical things, you have no direction. But when you go a step further and say, OK, I simply cut here and take again one alpha, one beta, and then you see that this gamma here is not nicely 90 degree oriented, it is tilted. And that makes already a symmetry. Here we see that we have the ADP and the ADP and the phosphate. And now when we have the rotational step, what happens is that this gamma is moving. And now it comes in close proximity to this epitope and makes this pocket here smaller and even smaller, like a nutcracker, and this other one becomes wider. And it continues in this way, and now it has a nice asymmetry introduced to say, this alpha is now closed, this beta is now open. And when it is rotating, you have nicely the movements going on in this so-called catalytic site, exactly what you can see in our atomic structure, that you have a pulsation, of the subunits while this is rotating. And that means when we pump protons backwards to the side of the catalytic centers, we bring always a conformational change which says nutcracker close, form ATP, nutcracker open, release the ATP of life. And having said this about the proton transport, please uh, ignore in the future any textbook which is, which is showing that the proton is going into the catalytic center. That's simply wrong. That's not the idea of bringing the proton back. The idea to bring the proton back is to drive this rotational movements I just showed to you. Okay, what does it all have to do with truck discovery in mycobacteria? We have this rotating machine. And I told you that in evolution, the, the different organisms have become very specified in the ring of the Lord with different numbers. Can we make use out of it? 
The company Johnson and Johnson has discovered that BDQ I mentioned before. And what it does do is it binds exactly to that C ring and goes inside, as we will see in a second, and by binding so, it is preventing that the ring of the Lord can rotate and therefore can pump protons to the other side. And it does even bind on the reverse side of this machine and is interacting here with the second binding side. And we have two wedges which hinder the total rotation. And then, as I said before, people were happy in 2012. But, as I said it with the river Boutin, you have on one side the bottle of champagne because you are celebrating your success. And these bloody bastards have already a mutation made. And that was the case that even after a very short time of bringing this molecule onto the market, this has been uh, then realized. Clinical uh, uh, resistant mutants came up. And another dilemma came up which was predictable namely unfavorable toxicity. It was actually known even before it was approved that there's a high accumulation of toxicity which can lead to other diseases. And there was a drug-drug interaction of this BDQ with other frontline drugs. And that makes it, of course, a big dilemma. And we are back to our song of silence. Hello, darkness, my old friend. That is why how very often a day of a scientist can start. But a scientist has also the other side and says, the vision, this was planted in my brain. This should still remain because it gives us the energy. And it gave us the energy to say, okay, if we have then differences in particular in this machine which, which makes energy, then let us look further to other subunits. And we did. We looked into this gamma subunit here in blue and compared the amino acid sequences and saw that the ones for mycobacteria have a peptide which is only in mycobacteria. That is perfect because if you have then a drug, it will only bind to this and not to the human one. And I indicated here also uh, extra peptides for other species in plants and in another bacterium to which I will come in a second. But what is this extra loop doing? Well, this extra loop is binding to the peripheral stalk and hinders here rotation for a while. And then it can move on further, stops for a while, and then can continue to rotate and comes then in contact again with this, what is called the peripheral stalk. And then we were thinking, hey, that's cool, because what we could do is to interrupt this interaction. And we did, and we found this new molecule, and we said, let us understand and then translate. And we have found this molecule gamma MF1, which is killing mycobacteria very nicely. Uh, and this is important uh, because to prevent, as it is seen here, only growth is one thing. But you have also to kill the bacteria, which are simply silent in our lungs, right? So, and we have then tested uh, resistant strains in India, and we could nicely show these are really potent. And what you have to test then is, are they toxic? And so we tested them against uh, human embryonic stem cells. And even we tested these against other bacteria which are in our gut and which are needed. Yeah, so we, we cannot uh, de de destroy them like E. coli. Uh, e. coli is very important for this. I indicated to you in two of the slides before that we have this extra loop. And some species like uh, the uh, chloroplasts and uh, a bacterium like Acerobacterium woody, they have this also. And they need this to have a certain regulation which is specific for them. Therefore, in the future, when you see a tiny difference among species, always ask, do they have a meaning? Can they be of mechanistic or regulative importance? And that can help you to find a new drug. So, the secret sits in the middle and knows. We have seen this now with that gamma subunit. And there's another secret, which is the epsilon subunit. And this is also rotating with the ring and with the gamma, and it can move up and it can move down. And what we have seen is that in mycobacteria, the sequence is totally different than in any other species. And I said, okay, let us 
then solve the atomic structure of it. And that is what you see here rotating. Importantly is that this end, this helicus, are much, much shorter than in our human enzyme or in any other bacterium. And that means in mycobacterium, this can never reach this upper part. And that means they have to have a totally different kind of regulation. And we wanted to prove this. We have simply made a mutation and have asked, so does that do anything to the bacterium? And we have seen, yes, the colony formation is totally different. We have only one third of the overall length when we compare it to the wild type. And we can really see that the ATP in the cell is drastically reduced. So that means this is a fantastic target to look at. And we did. And what you can do is you take all the structural, mechanistical, genetical information into a computer and generate what people call then a pharmacophore model. And then you go into a pipeline of millions of compounds in a virtual world. And then you will get a, a certain amount of molecules. And one of these molecules you could identify was EGCG. And this is an element of the green tea. And this can nicely reduce the synthesis of the mycobacteria, as you can see here. And we have also identified where it is nicely binding to and could identify even two more of these molecules. The ATP synthases usually can not only generate ATP, they can also work in the reverse. They can cleave ATP into ADP and phosphate, but not in mycobacteria. And this is a very clever process because it prevents then that the bacterium is wasting the currency of life, ATP, yeah? when it is not hydrolyzing. And we wanted to understand why is this the case. And we have seen in the sequence that there is something at the end which is only in mycobacteria. And we saw in our structure that here the extension is nicely wrapping around the gamma subunit. And what does it do? It does nicely bind to the gamma and is stopping the rotation. So no further hydrolysis can occur. So a wonderful, clever mechanism over millions of years, simply with a shorter extension of this alpha subunit. And then we said, oh, great, because if we block that, then we can generate a compound and we have generated a new compound which is nicely affecting this enzyme as well as the growth of mycobacteria. And in this way, I could continue with a lot of other inhibitors and insights we have achieved on this topic, in particular with our network, which we call TopNet. And we have generated a platform where you have screening of millions of compounds, where you get structural insights, as I have shown here on this side. What we have done, we have identified more than uh, 12 new compounds, new targets, and tested them even in the mice and to see whether the, the uh, lung uh, mice was affected. We have also generated cocktails because if you like to overcome multi-drug resistance, you need more drugs to come together. And in particular in Singapore, you know, it's a kind of um, must to come up with a cocktail because we have this wonderful cocktail uh, which is a wonderful representative and therefore you are highly motivated as a scientist in Singapore to find um, a cocktail which is uh, nicely working in a similar way. And this has led to a number of patents we have identified and uh, also filed and also licensed out to pharma companies in the United States. So a vision in my brain was always to find then more of these pathways in mycobacteria. Because when mycobacteria, as we could see before, are exposed to a new drug, they will say, H -B -H -B, I found another way. I don't live on carbohydrates anymore. I live only on fatty acids. And I live only on amino acids. Right? So that means you have also to understand the other pathways, which I don't go to. But just to say that is what we like to achieve. And of course, everything looks like that you need at the end of the day thousand arms and thousand eyes. But nevertheless, at the end, there's always light. And there's light which motivates you to go more forward and to understand the bacterium in depth and to try to get new compounds identified.
And we do the same thing also for this beautiful mycobacteria called Mycobacteria abscessus, which do belong, as you see, to another class of mycobacteria. And these are really bastards because they are totally resistant against any existing drug. And as you can see here in this list, causing so many diseases. And the bloody thing is they are everywhere. They are even when you go for your shower, when you drink water, in particular here in the tropic area, you will have them all the time. Even in the clinic, when you cook to 100 degree everything, or when you use high pH and, as I said, antibiotics, no chance. And this is a big problem, particularly in Singapore. Again, as I said, we are in a tropic area. We have a high and dense population here in Singapore and a very um, elderly population because this has to do, uh, this is a very important point because they get much more uh, infected than younger ones. And here, just to give you a very, very brief uh, overview, we have also found new drugs, we have found new structures, which we have also patented out. And here we are working together with uh, Tantak Singh Hospital, where we have a significant number of patients, as well as also with the lung uh, center in Boston, close to Hamburg, which is uh, uh, belonging to the WHO. So, the beauty of molecular machines, we have seen the beauty of molecular machines in our switch. We have seen that the switch can drive the bacterium with a flagella motor. We have intensively spoken about the rotation in this motor generating ATP. I introduced very quickly the nanomotor, the actins which are running over the filaments. And another one you know very well from your studies are the ribosomes which are generating the proteins. Can we really talk about machines? A machine needs the rotor, a shaft and a stator. And when we take our F-type ATP synthase, then we see, yes, we have a stator, we have a shaft, and we have this rotating element. And this all leads us to the end to generate ATP. And even in the very old old A-type ATP synthesis, we have the rotary elements, we have the status, slightly modified, adapted to the harsh conditions. And they have this peripheral stalk, which is important to provide elastic energy, which is even in our myosin. So you see a machine is there. We do see that there's a repetition of elements which are important to keep conserved in nature. So does that help us to think a little bit like Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci and to say, okay, where nature finishes producing its own species, man begins, of course, with the help of nature, to create an infinity of species. When we look once more to our machine, which is rotating in the ring and also in the gamma, what we did was, we did also on, only take this part here, where catalysis is taking on, and we put a very small nanobead on it. And then we were asking, can this really rotate? And we have looked then in the microscope, and we have said, yes, it rotates anticlockwise, like a Wankel engine. With the difference of a Wankel engine, which has an efficiency of only 40%, this engine has a, an efficiency of 82%. Can we use this for engineering? We have worked together with Katharina Swanberg in Lund on this protein nicely called Hamlet. And this is in the mother milk. And it can be used to prevent cancer, certain forms of cancer, as you can see here in this studies nicely, which we did together with Katharina. And we solve the structure. <clears throat> and what is important in the structure is that this piece here, which is extended, can, as we could see with the switch, become compact, extended, compact, and extended. The point is that you would like to get to all of the cells, this hamlet transported. And then we were thinking, OK, if we have, in principle, a helicopter, which is then rotating, why not putting a nanopropeller to it? And that is what we have designed and also patented to transport 
with molecules to any kind of cell. And this has led to uh, the pharma company Hamlet Pharma in Lund. So science can only be done in a network, can only be done with enthusiastic scientists. And I would like to acknowledge the scientists in my own lab over the years, then people at our university, which are belonging to our top net, which is also an excellence cluster, which is uh, funded by the National uh, Research Foundation here in Singapore. We have people also in NOS with Thomas Dick, who has in the meantime moved, uh, in, in, in Duke NOS, who has moved to, uh, to New York. We have uh, partners um, in uh, Minnesota as well as in India. I mentioned this regarding the resistant mutants. And uh, then, of course, the funding sources I mentioned in uh, NIF, NMRC, the Ministry of Education, as well as also the National Institute of Health in the United States, where we have intensive collaborations with. What I hope, and, and what is still my dream, which is planted in my brain and still remains, is that you enjoy nature because it is a part of you, and you are a part of nature. And for thing, this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you like to address questions, you can also send me an email, no problem at all. I, I know uh, how this is uh, <laughs> uh, to be a little bit shy, so simply feel free. And uh, if you would like to learn more, you can contact me anytime. If you like to visit us and to look how a microbacterium does look like, or how one can inhibit this, let me know. Drop by. We would be most happy to see you. Thank you.